Why is collaboration good business? Why share? What does shipping have in common with the pharmaceutical industry? And what is anthill innovation? How does that concept relate to the IT industry? Welcome to Guys Everything, the podcast ranging in subjects from sex to astrophysics. You can find this podcast on isna.org, my homepage, and at uh, several of the large podcast outlets like iTunes, Spotify, and others. This is podcast number 13, centering around collaboration. It was inspired by my workshop at uh, the Vista International Conference last week in Tromsø. And uh, VISTA stands for Women in Shipping and Transport Association, and they have an annual conference, and I did a workshop there, uh, which was summed up in my uh, podcast number 12. And the title of that podcast was Why Women Will Be the Last to Be Replaced by Robots and Artificial Intelligence. And at the end of my workshop, uh, some ladies asked if I could do something to help the shipping industry collaborate more. Because women often find themselves as uh, those uh, pushing for collaboration, more collaboration in this very male of the malest, uh, the malest of the male industries, the shipping industry. Whereas the men would often be skeptical or resisting or even outright stopping collaboration from happening. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll pick up that gauntlet and I'll make this podcast uh, centered around collaboration. Uh, but I will do more than just talk about the shipping industry. Actually, the shipping industry will be one part of this podcast, but I will talk about collaboration in the broader sense. Uh, which industries do collaborate a lot and which uh, industries do not collaborate, and sometimes, for good reason, do not collaborate. But uh, I'll also pick up a lot of uh, uh, beneficial collaborations around the globe. Uh, I will also talk about the shipping, of course, uh, specifically, but also cover uh, an area which is very dear to my heart, which is the open source software, the, the IT industry, where sharing is happening uh, on, a, on a much broader scale and much faster than many other industries. I will cover some technical terms, but fear not, I will try to explain them as I go along. And then at the end, I will sum up and uh, talk about uh, why collaboration and sharing is important then and I will also have at the very end a proposal for a business policy that most businesses should adopt. So let's go into collaboration. Uh, There are two reasons why people would collaborate. Either people or entities, businesses, two or more would uh, come together and do something Uh, and the reason would be one of two ways one can say. One is to collaborate for the common good, do something for everybody or for society or for the the global good. Another one is uh, from the interest of my own business to drive in more uh, revenue or to cut costs. And when you have this, uh, this cocktail of these two coming together, we both do it because of the common good, but also for our own business sake. That's when you have a real powerful solution. When it comes to doing collaboration for the common good, uh, I will give you the Norwegian word of the day. Because in Norway, we have a very strong concept ingrained in our culture called dugnad. Dugnad comes from Old Norse uh, having to do with the word duganes, eller dug, which is uh, uh, being able. And dugnad uh, means being able together. And when people come together, maybe in a small community or just your neighbors coming together to mow the lawn together or, you know, uh, rake the, the leaves off the, mow, the lawn or paint the garage or teach the kids in the summer holiday uh, how to read and write better uh, or do something together which is not paid, but we do it because we think it's the best to do for this small community or even for the world at large. This is Dugnad. It's not easily translated to English because the English language doesn't have this concept fully ingrained in it. If you try to translate it, the closest you will get is communal work, but that does not really cover what Dugnad is because there is a tradition in Norway to get together and just do things for 
me and uh, you and for the common good. Now, there are certain industries and, and uh, areas in, uh, in the world where there is very little or no collaboration, where collaboration might even be completely absent. And one such example is stage magicians. They live off the secrets of why and how their magic works. And in that case, uh, there is very little collaboration on why it works, on what mag magical tricks works. There are people that teach basic tricks, but when you get to the real top-notch stage magicians, they tend to be secretive about how they do their magic for a really good reason. Because if you knew the magic, it will destroy the magic. So, so that is an area where collaboration is you would advise against collaboration or at least against too much collaboration. So, so they, they should keep their secrets because that is the common good. Another area is pharmaceutical industry where there is so much protection and secrecy against anybody else ripping off your medicine and your investment. And there is so much focus on patents and protecting of intellectual property that the effects is that people are actually dying uh, due to lack of cheap medicine uh, for against AIDS in Africa. People are dying every day. And uh, those who are dying might be extreme talent that could do ex fantastic good for, for, the, for the world. I mean, the next Elon Musk could be one of those kids in Congo dying from AIDS or the next Albert Einstein. And we'll never know because they died. And this is the flip side of uh, protecting your intellectual property, is that others will not be able to improve upon it. Um, I launched many years ago, maybe 11 or 12 years ago, I, I launched this concept, or actually it was 2005, I think, I launched the concept of ant hill innovation. It's a type of innovation where you build upon what every other ant has built before, like an ant hill. And uh, one example where anthill innovation is, is, uh, is very much at the forefront is science. Because science used to be uh, an area where one person could change the whole scene. Like uh, Albert Einstein, Isaac Newton, Maxwell, the Curies, etc. And, uh, and you had this one man, uh, total paradigm shifts in physics, for instance which is very rare these days because uh, it has become so complicated that you have to, uh, you have to rely on this anthill innovation concept. You have to work together in collaboration and not uh, just as one person. You will have to be an ant in the anthill and contribute to the bigger scene in science. Now, another area where uh, collaboration is very absent uh, or on the surface, it might not look absent, but where it actually is quite absent, and that is between certain religions. There is uh, friction and there is strife and there is war against uh, various fractions and various larger religions. Um, and many religions think upon themselves as a monopoly on the one true path. And when they do, really think that this is the only way that you can come forward and you can be salvaged or, or you know, that the light is only on our path. When you really think that, then any collaboration is just on face value and for the PR. And one such example is the Church of Scientology. Scientology believes that it is the only one true path for yourself and for mankind. Everybody else is wrong. The Christians are wrong, the Muslims are wrong, the Buddhists are not that wrong, but they're still wrong, and the Hindus are also wrong, and everybody else is wrong. So Scientology is a religion that believes that uh, it would be beneficial to planet Earth if Scientology would take over everything. And the, the collaboration you see when Scientology uh, leaders are talking to other religions and uh, collaborating with other religions is just for PR and face value. They look like they are collaborating and they say that you can, yes, of course you can be a Muslim while still being a Scientologist, but that is not actually true. It is a monopoly on the truth and Scientology is litigious. I don't, how do you say that in English? Litig litigious? Uh, they are litigating. Uh, everybody that tries to use Scientology uh, their own way. They are extremely 
uh, focused on protecting their copyright and barring anybody else from using the knowledge that their founder, Elrond Hubbard, had written. It's, a, it's, it's such a focus on monopoly on the one true path that it's hardly ever seen in the world as strong as that. So there is less um, collaboration between, uh, between various religions than what could be seen on the, on the face. Now, there are other areas in the world where collaboration is beneficial and at the forefront, and some of them might not be that obvious, because if you look at the areas of athletes, and top athletes in particular, you might think that that's such a fierce competitive scene. They are focusing on getting the gold, uh, and nobody else will get the gold because it's only one one, uh, uh, person that will get it. You will think that that very fierce competitive scene would be where you would find very little collaboration. But that's not true. Because many of the top athletes and trainers are sharing how they train and what they do to become really good. And uh, notable examples is Jurgen Klopp, the the coach, the manager of of Liverpool, and Pep Guardiola of Manchester City. These are people that uh, invite other trainers to come and see how they train Liverpool and Manchester City. And, and there are many other trainers like that who are so confident in their way of doing things that they think they, if they just keep up their game and be the best, it doesn't matter if somebody else follows them because they will always be followers anyway. So collaboration is not a, 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 it's not a threat to them. They don't feel threatened by collaboration. Another area is writers. Writers read lots of books. And they get inspiration from other writers. And also on the back of covers, you will all, all, all sometimes or maybe all, almost always find uh, other writers that will recommend this book, especially when it comes to nonfiction books. You will read at the back and you will see this writer recommends this book in this way. And they will write the preface for each other because they know that if you have a million followers and I have a million followers and we recommend each other's books. We might both get 1.5 million followers. So it benefits both of us. Um, And also when you go back to the football example, if everybody else plays better football, like Pep Guardiola is pushing for uh, for his way of playing football and Jurgen Klopp is pushing for his very, you know, fierce and and, uh, energetic way of playing football. If more teams were playing better football, it will up the game of football. People will think it's better to watch football and it will benefit everybody. And uh, I mentioned the science part and science is no longer possible without collaboration. Another area or industry where collaboration is not so uh, so obvious, uh, it's actually more rip-off, uh, but an industry that does not benefit from much protection of intellectual property, that is the fashion industry. Because there is no real protection. There is no patents in the fashion industry. Copyright is absent. There is only trademarks. And the fashion industry does not seem to be very uh, restricted or suffering from the lack of intellectual property protection. Because it is an industry that is a total of $3 trillion worldwide, globally, per year. And it, it, it is 2% of the global GDP. It's a huge industry that is thriving without intellectual property uh, protection. Now, just a little side note on this, because I don't know if you, you as a listener know the difference between copyright patents and trademarks and the trade secrets. But um, patents is you have an idea and you patent the application of that idea. You patent something that is physical or it might not be that physical. You can actually have software patents even, but a way of doing something, a way of producing something, a way something is produced or the, or the result of that production can be patented so that nobody else can actually make that physical item or that expression of your idea uh, in, in the next 20 years. So you will have a monopoly that is granted to you for that way of digging a well or that way of making this uh, gizmo work the way it does. 
So you can, you can have a certain type of cup that is uh, self-heating or you can have a, a certain machine that says ping or something like that and uh, nobody else is then able to make that machine which is a, is a very interesting concept in that the, the moment you patent a way uh, or, or this machine then nobody else in the world where this patent is is um, uh, is uh, granted can then use their own materials that they own and their own hands to make the same object so you limit what other people can do with their material with what they own you limit their ability to create something and uh, it's interesting because that be- means that if you patent something, your idea then will trespass on other people's private property because they can no longer do certain things with their private property. And uh, just think about that. that. That's quite interesting. And this is covered in an interesting book which is called Against Intellectual Property by Stefan Kinsella. He is an American IP intellectual property lawyer and he talks about this problem of intellectual property where you know the reason why you have property laws in the first place is because you have scarcity of properties you have scarcity of metal you have scarcity of uh, various goods you have scarcity of animals and therefore you have this protection of property of land and of things and you regulate this by law because it is a scarce resource you regulate water, you regulate land, you re- regulate forest because it is a scarce resource. But when it comes to intellectual property, there is no scarcity of ideas. While I take a, If I steal your car, you no longer have the car. But if I take your idea and run with it, it's not like you don't have the idea anymore. You still have the idea. So theft is not theft when it comes to stealing somebody else's ideas, because you still have it. So what intellectual property laws, like patents and copyrights, etc., is doing is creating an artificial scarcity. Now this is covered in this uh, book called Against Intellectual Property. It is linked in the blog post for this, um, uh, this podcast at isna.org. And he covers this in great details, and he covers a a lot on why monopolies in general creates friction and often conflicts, like with religions. Um, So, and he covers what is patents, and he also covers what is copyright. And copyright is when I write something or I make something like artwork or, uh, you know, uh, a book or, or a painting or some expression that I put out there. Uh, I can say I can claim copyright on that, or actually, it's automatically in most com- uh, countries copyrighted. Meaning, uh, nobody else can then copy that and uh, and benefit from that, and sometimes not even copy it at all. And that is a different thing than patents, because patents has to do with physical objects or software, uh, whereas um, copyright has to do with the written word, uh, and they cannot even copy it, uh, copy the book. Etc. So that is the, that is copyright, and then you have trademark, which is uh, an expression of a logo or a phrase which is uh, owned by somebody, so that you cannot um, use the same phrase as Microsoft. You cannot use uh, the logo of McDonald's, and and that's a different thing because then uh, the reason why trademark is there is that it will limit counterfeit products. That uh, it's not a Rolex; it's a Bolex, maybe that you buy. So, uh, so trademark is, is uh, stopping counterfeit products. So these are patents, copyrights, and trademarks. But if you want to go more into that and really understand the differences and, uh, and uh, how it affects society in general, read Stephen Kinsella's book uh, called Against Intellectual Property. Another book which is almost the same title, but which is written by two European top economists, is called Against Intellectual Monopoly. It's, a, it's an interesting book, whereas the Against Intellectual Property book by Stephen Kinsella is a small book of uh, maybe 50 pages, uh, Against Intellectual Monopoly by Michelle Baldrin and uh, David uh, Levine is um, 
is a more comprehensive book. It goes through uh, the history of intellectual property and uh, the various uh, reasons why uh, certain things happen in history. Like with pharmaceutical industry, it covers up until 1978, there was no protection uh, in Italy uh, from ripping off or, or, you know, there was no patent or copyright protection for the pharmaceutical industries. And up until 1978, I believe they say Italy was the number four nation in the pharmaceutical market. And when they went in and uh, adopted the inter- intellectual property rights of copyright and patents, it fell like a stone to the 12th place and still falling. So that's an example of a nation that had a thriving pharmaceutical industry and it was basically killed off by intellectual property protection that was supposed to give it more fuel to help innovate more, but the exact opposite happened. Another example is if you look at the 1800s and compare Germany versus Britain, Great Britain, you will see that the German Industrial Revolution was, uh, was given life by a lot more scientific publications than in Great Britain. Actually, Germany put out 10 times the amount of scientific research and published 10 times more uh, regarding industrial uh, benefits and, and uh, science that helped ger- German industry uh, rocket 10 times more than Great Britain. And the difference? In Germany, they didn't have copyright laws. In Britain, they did. So in one year, I think it was in 1843, Germany put out 14,000 scientific papers, whereas Britain had a pure fraction of that, much less than uh, a tenth of it. So, But on the whole, during almost a century, there were an output of 10 times more scientific papers in Germany than in Britain. (coughs) So when people are talking about Uh, intellectual property rights are, you know, there to help innovation. The fact of the matter, the historical fact, is that it does the opposite. Which is bringing me now to shipping. Shipping is a very conservative business, a very conservative industry, and there is very little collaboration. And on London International Shipping Week, one year ago in 2017, I held uh, a talk there. And uh, I talked about the reason for collaboration and why you should have more open source software type of mentality going into the shipping industry. Also to fend off potential external threats from other players, which is not shipping, because the end customer often do not care whether his goods travel by ship or by rocket or by some other means. They only care that it goes from place A to place B. And okay, shipping happens to be in between. But uh, when, when, you, when you look at the competition, I mean, Amazon or somebody else can go in and, uh, and shake up the, the shipping industry thoroughly. And, uh, and that would be an existential threat, perhaps, to the shipping industry. Or when Elon Musk comes in with his, well, we just send rockets from Sydney to New York, and that goes a lot faster than airplanes and can even be cheaper. Then you can have goods maybe shipped by rockets. It sounds really science fiction and out there, but, you know, in 40, 50 years, it could be the reality. I think shipping industry is in for a real shakeup by that and other um, external threats. And as I said just recently in my Singapore talk or panel talk in Shipping 2030, I said the only thing that will perhaps bring shipping industry together and people would start collaborating more is an alien invasion. And uh, I said that um, because it, it's, it's true for the world. I mean, if, if the US and China were to really go uh, into a strong collaboration, it would be because we're attacked by an alien race or something. I'm saying this jokingly, of course, but I would say if there was an alien invasion force coming to get us, um, all the nations on Earth would be one nation within a week. They are not like physically one nation, but they would collaborate and act as one force against this alien invasion. 
And then people said, or somebody said in shipping 2030, oh, maybe that alien innovation could be the innovation of women into the shipping industry. And I think that's true. I think more women into the shipping industry would be a fantastic idea because women tend to be more empathetic and think more in the in a holistic manner and think about maybe how one can help shipping industry and not uh, contribute so much to the global warming and to the pollution of planet Earth. So I think the alien innovation very well could be and should be uh, more women into the shipping industry. Uh, I learned at the London International Shipping Week that the shipping management companies, the ship managers, the ones that is running the ships, not the ship owners, but the companies that take care of the management of the ship, many of the big ones have in-house software houses of up to 70 people that are creating software to manage the ships. I'm thinking, what the heck? And all these big software houses within the management companies are then reinventing the wheel. And I proposed... Well, that must be a a hell of a lot of millions of dollars each year going out the window because one thing, you can just pitch all this together because you you could at least collaborate on this to cut your own cost and and even cut more cost if you you build it on open source software that is free and, and, and for everybody to use out there and just build upon that and just modify it to fit your business model. But they're so afraid of collaboration that is very, very hard for them to see that that could be beneficial. So I'm, I'm walking around uh, at this shipping conference as trying to inspire people to be more open, trying to help them see that uh, using open source software could be a way forward to cut your own cost. And I, uh, I've seen so many examples of this because I used to run a free and open source software company called Freecode for eight years. And I've seen that many examples of collaboration In industries you wouldn't even think would collaborate and when they start to do they cut cost immensely and one example which is a notable good example is the nyk business owner or ship owner in in japan Uh, they have some 750 large ships and they are one of the big players in the world of shipping and uh, mr ando san of uh, of nyk has uh, has, is a driver behind the Smart Ship Association platform. And it's his brainchild and it is his way of trying to help shipping companies, both owners and ship management companies and all the other players out there, together uh, to share data from managing and running ships. And all these data that comes from IoT sensors on board ships and all kinds of ship data, bringing it into a ship data center and uh, harvest that data and analyze that data for the common good, for the good of the shipping industry, and for the good of uh, less pollution, for the good of more efficient travel, for less uh, fuel cost, for better uh, preventive maintenance of ships, etc. So this is a notable example. And interestingly enough, where you, where you look at, it's coming from Japan, a very conservative country, and it's spearheading uh, the sharing of data and collaboration between players in the shipping industry. I would say that's laudable. That's that's really something. Now, next thing is the open source software scene. And um, I'm going to rattle off a lot here, so bear with me. <laughs> First of all, open source software. What does that mean? It means that the the source code of the software is open, which means that if you run a piece of software, if it's open source, you can change the software as you see fit. You're free to change anything in the software to accommodate for your needs. Now, if you're not a programmer, you can still hire somebody to change the software to fit your needs. So open source software is so that you have open access to the tools. You can change it for your own benefit. And then many of the the licenses for these open source software out there also says if you change it and you give it forward to somebody else, you also have to give your changes open. You have to open up your changes. And that enforces the until innovation is so that everybody can build upon what everybody else has done before you. And what you do, you pitch in, everybody else can build upon that. It enforces the Norwegian Dugnad. 
Now that is open source software and many people think about oh, maybe that's some fringe over there type of little tiny something where open source is maybe for the particularly interested in that. No, 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 no. This is running the internet. Without open source software there would be no internet. I mean we're talking about when you surf the web it's about let's see there's some numbers here 96.5 uh, percent of the top 1 million domains in the world ranked by Alexa runs Linux as the operating system 96.5 percent so it is what runs the internet and also all the, the switches in between etc a large percentage a huge percentage of that is running uh, open source software if you look at the consumer devices the total of consumer devices and we talk about your pc the smartphone the tablets all the consumer uh, computers then android which is linux has a total of 60 percent total market share and if you talk about small systems like in what we call embedded systems uh, linux as the operating system which is open source runs on the Amazon Kindle e-readers, it runs on smart TVs and appliances, refrigerators and whatnot, drones, and it runs Teslas. Tesla uses Linux as their operating system for the the, the car system, the, the display that you see in the Tesla, etc. All the functions is run on Linux. And uh, one little note there I would just quickly pitch in is you know, Elon Musk, he did something quite interesting. Uh, he abandoned all the patents. And in one uh, post uh, on Tesla.com back in 2014 in June, he wrote, all, your, all our patents are belong to you, which is a play on the zero wing uh, computer game uh, back in the uh, 1980s uh, or in the beginning of 90s where uh, there was a badly translated uh, game called Zero Wing into uh, English, where one of the phrases was, all your base are belong to us. Anyway, it's a play on that. And um, he writes, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm actually going to read a little bit here. He says, all our patent are belong to us, or belong to you, I mean. Yesterday, there was a wall of Tesla patents in the lobby of our Palo Alto headquarters. That is no longer the case. They have been removed in the spirit of the open source movement for the adma advancement of electric vehicle technology. So remove them just because you want to share all the trade secrets, the way the Tesla is produced so that others can do the same. Because that will benefit the world. And it will also expose Tesla to more competition, which in itself is more healthy to Tesla because they have to tiptoe on their toes, be in the forefront and innovate more. Because if you have a monopoly, your innovation, the need for innovation diminishes. So it actually works against its uh, original so-called intent. And he writes at the end, technology leadership is not defined by patents. We believe that applying the open source philosophy to our patents will strengthen rather than diminish Tesla's position. Interesting. So Elon Musk went all the way and actually went for the open source way of sharing and, uh, and uh, just collaborating on a massive scale with all the other competitors, but still making the, the scene of the electric vehicle more approachable by a lot of companies and making that business into a more healthy business. Now uh, we have more examples of Linux on the web. Um, you know Amazon Web Services they host web servers and 92% of the web servers hosted by Amazon Web Services are running Linux. Even Microsoft's own Azure more than 50% of their virtual machines are running Linux. If you look at the supercomputers of the world, the real large number crunchers that science is using, NASA, uh, you know, the weather uh, predictions, etc. Out of the 500 top supercomputers in the world, 498 are running Linux. And the two ones that are not running Linux, they're running AIX Unix, which is an IBM way of uh, doing Unix. Windows is nowhere to be found. 
You have web service, you have WordPress, which totals, uh, which is a content management system that has 60% market share. All of the in internet infrastructure is run basically on open source. And you have all the small things like Arduino and Raspberry Pi, etc. is also open source. You have the robot operating system being open source. You have a lot of open source running out there. And you have the players that is pushing open source, the usual ones pushing Linux, like Red Hat and Canonical, which are Linux companies. But you have other big players that are contributing a lot to open source and using open source themselves, like Google, Facebook, Huawei, which is a big contributor to Linux, IBM, Intel, also a huge contributor to Linux, LinkedIn, is a contributor to various open source projects. Microsoft itself released the .NET development tools, Visual Studio Code, etc. And they also recently bought GitHub for some $7.5 billion. GitHub being the big repository that has 28 billion public open source software repositories where they host open source projects. This might be a little technical, but let's rattle through it. We have Netflix, lots of own development projects that they are releasing freely. Oracle, big player. Samsung Electronics, big player when it comes to contributing to Linux. Twitter, huge one. Adobe has 250 public repositories for their open source projects. Wikipedia, obviously, which is the fifth largest website on the earth. It has close to 50 million articles in 301 languages. It's run on open source and their way of uh, contribution, their way of pushing knowledge to the world is completely open. It is sharing is caring from day one. But are these only, what about the small players? Because one of the questions I got when I rattled this off to somebody else, actually I met my, my fiance, she said, but, but these are all, all big players. How about the small players? But some of these were small players when they started using open source, like Google and Facebook. And they based their business basically on open source. And they started contributing very early on because when they found something that they need to change in the underlying code, they would, by the license of that code, have to share that, that changes back to the community. And also startups, small startups, would benefit a lot from using already developed tools and not having to create their own tool and build up on the open source to get them uh, quicker into business with much less cost. So still, it works for the small and it works for the large ones. Now, collaboration and sharing. It can be for the common good and it can be for your own business sake. That's a summary on that. And lastly, my proposal for a business policy. Have collaboration as the default and instead have a strong business case if you were ever to do non-collaboration. What do I mean by that? Example. Instead of, of course we do not share, why should we? Instead of that, adopt, of course we sh should share. Why should we not? And instead of, of course we do not collaborate, why should we? Adopt, of course we collaborate, why should we not? So if you adopt the default position as, of course we share, of course we collaborate, then the burden of proof lies on why should we not share and why should we not collaborate. And in that you would get a stronger collaboration with more players in your industry. You would cut your own cost. And as a writer, when you recommend somebody else, you might just get them to recommend you and you would be having a bigger pie to share or to, to have your cut from. So if you do it for the common good, fine. If you do it for your own business sake, fine. If you do it for both, fantastic. Thank you very much for your attention.